Dave McElhatton, Wendy Takuda, Wayne Walker, and Brian Sussman. This is KPIX Eyewitness News at 6. One after another, they go up in smoke. American combat engineers methodically destroying Saddam Hussein's tanks. Good evening. The Iraqis have given up. Their once powerful weapons are going up in smoke. The Iraqi soldiers are being taken prisoner so fast, the Allies say they can't keep count. President Bush says, or the latest estimate is about 175,000. And to give you an idea of just how staggering that number is, that is a few thousand more people than the population in the city of Fremont here in the Bay Area. The fighting is over, and now the questions begin. What happened to the... Uh, ...has now agreed to uh, designate military commanders to meet with coalition counterparts to arrange for the military aspects of this ceasefire. The fighting is over. For some, the enemy has turned into an object of pity. And I feel honestly very sorry, but what a position to be in, you know, fighting us as well as having the death squads uh, keeping them right at the border and Saddam Hussein there uh, haranguing and screaming in the background. It was just an awful situation. No pity for the Iraqis in Kuwait. It's beyond imagination what these people did. And it's like you never expected it from a neighbor who we've held over the years to have such hatred towards us. Why? A rich and proud capital is in ruins. The Iraqis left their mark all over the city and the countryside. The American Embassy is back in American hands, and Americans are heroes. It's a good time. Oh. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, how's it work? <laughs> I hate Hussein, I hate Arafat, I, I want to kill Saddam. On the other side, Saddam Hussein is blamed for the destruction and the mass kidnapping of Kuwaitis. We've heard numbers everywhere from one to 45,000. My brother also, he wanted to go to the mosque to pray. And before he, uh, he go, they uh, catch him and uh, took him to somewhere that we don't know where. Out in the desert west of the capital, American paratroopers are still rounding up Iraqi soldiers. Tell them keep your hands on your head! And they're destroying the last remnants of the Iraqi army. No Iraqis in the vehicle this time. The fighting is over and now the questions begin. What happened to the fearsome Iraqi army? How did the Allies win so convincingly and so quickly? As Mike Hegett has discovered, the answer is in the quality of the opponent, the tactics of the Allies, and the general in charge. It wasn't supposed to be this easy. Going in, we were told Iraq was a battle-hardened, formidable foe with the fourth largest army in the world. Wrong. I don't know where they got this figure of the Iraqi military being the fourth largest military in the world. It really is a third world army, and I don't say that in a denigrating uh, way. I'd put Iraq about nine or ten on a good day. So how did we get the wrong idea to begin with? I seem to remember these fellas telling us. The duty of the military planner is to assume the worst and hope for the best. That's the way you plan military campaigns. At the same time, there, there clearly was some uh, uh, lowballing and, and, and puffery going on in the administration. So it turns out we beat an army that in truth was nowhere near a match. And we beat it because it was led by someone who, it turns out, was a military imbecile. Our military had five months to put together a battle plan that was very specifically directed toward targets, uh, the locations of which we knew very clearly through satellite technology and also the fact that the Saddam Hussein fixed his forces down here. All those things contributed to, to this kind of a victory. And given all that time, the plan we came up with pounded the dickens out of those fixed forces from the air and then encircled and squeezed the rest of the juice out of them on the ground. All of it done with better weapons and a better trained and motivated Army. And I'll tell you, this is the best army that I ever saw in 31 years. This is the best one. But we also won because we smartened up. Lessons we learned after Vietnam and lessons from General Norman Schwarzkopf's childhood. Out of Vietnam and the wars before it came the Goldwater Nichols Bill in the mid-1980s. You never heard of it. But what it did was set up a mechanism by which the next war, this one, in the field there would be one commander, one guy in charge. You don't find the Navy competing with the Air Force, the Air Force competing with the Army, the Army competing with the Marines about who was going to do this or do that. 
one person gives the orders and those orders are followed and it worked beautifully. Extraordinary move. The guy in charge you, turned I, out to I be General Norman Schwarzkopf, nicknames aside, a solid soldier, a man particularly well suited for this war in this part of the world. His father, who was a general, had been stationed in Iran in a military advisory uh, capacity. And I obviously, uh, as a youngster, why Schwarzkopf uh, learned a great deal about the Mideast and about Islamic culture, and I think it certainly paid off. And being sensitive to Arab needs on both sides helped keep the coalition together, vital to success. And a military success is what it turned out to be. Thank you, boss. In San Francisco, Mike Hagedis, Channel 5, Eyewitness News. One final note on the Gulf War. While the Iraqis lost, the other big loser was the Soviet Union. The people Mike talked with all pointed out that the Iraqis were Soviet trained and equipped, and it was Soviet tactics the Iraqis tried to use, and it all failed. We have an update on the Gulf situation later on Eyewitness News. When? Here in the Bay Area, they have been accused of everything from obscenity to sexual exploitation. But tonight, one of the infamous Mitchell brothers is accused of murder. The victim, his own brother. Manuel Ramos is outside the Mitchell Brothers Theater on O'Farrell Street right now. Manny. Well, Wendy, the theater is closed tonight. None of the flashing lights and no people streaming in to see the, the nude dancing, the adult films, and the other forms of adult entertainment that went on in there. Said people are just walking by, shaking their head in disbelief. It seemed like everybody knew Artie and Jim. So the Mitchell Brothers murder case has sent shockwaves in the pornography business, not only here, but throughout the world. The sign on the front door of the most famous adult theater in the city mentions the death, but not the fact that one of the Mitchell brothers, 45-year-old Artie, may have been murdered by his 47-year-old brother Jim. The Mitchell brothers were always in the news. Besides their adult theater, they also made adult films distributed worldwide. They also spent a lot of time in court involved in pornography cases. Police say they don't know why Jim went to Artie's house in Corte Madera at 10.20 last night, or why he would have killed his brother. There was no indication that he was going to come there. Uh, to prepare them for this, no. At this point, you had no motive? No motive. Artie was found in a hallway near his bathroom. He'd been shot several times. His live-in girlfriend, Julie Bajo, shown here on a Mitchell theater card, called police. They heard noises, and Artie was the only one who went out to investigate, at which time there were uh, gunshots sounding, and Lori uh, immediately went to the phone and dialed 911, at which time we responded. Police found Jim outside the house. They say he was carrying a 22 rifle and had a revolver in a shoulder holster. He hasn't said anything to investigators. Neighbors were shocked. They knew how hard he made a living, but it didn't matter. He gave Suzanne Irvine a complimentary pass to his theaters. She said she accepted politely, but never used it. Nice guy. It didn't matter to me what his business was, as long as he was a good neighbor. Mike McColgan says Artie appeared to be a great father when his kids would show up on weekends. He was liked despite his business. I don't know how many, if they all knew about his, like his theater activities, but that didn't seem to matter. That was, that was like a job, and this was his home, and uh, he was very likable. Neighbors believe they saw Jim and Artie together at the house, and they say the brothers appeared friendly and loving. Now, no one here at the theater will officially talk about the case, but I did talk to one of the performers who came by a little while ago. She told me that whenever Artie and Jim were together, they seemed very friendly. They seemed like they were in love with each other, you know, loving brothers. And she said this morning she was told that the theater was closed because Artie was dead. Uh, she didn't tell her anything else, so she sent Jim, the suspect, a condolence card and flowers. Reporting live in San Francisco, I'm Manuel Ramos. Okay, Maddie. Dave? As was mentioned, the Mitchell brothers have been known as the porn kings of San Francisco for more than 20 years. Although reviled by a large section of America, they're also viewed as pioneers in the eroticism industry. And they've constantly fought legal battles to keep their empire going. For decades, the Mitchell brothers have not only sold pornography to their customers, they've been selling the public on their right to produce it. The brothers were in their 20s when they opened the O'Farrell Street Theater with films and live sex acts. They were busted and prosecuted several times for obscenity. When they got nailed, they just got themselves an attorney. Cameraman Al Bullock has spent decades chronicling the history of the porn movement of the Bay Area. In his film, Porn is Born, he says that what set the Mitchells apart was their ability to use negative publicity to their advantage. 
every time they were raided, they would call me and say, hey, we're going to have a, the cops down here. We're, you might as well come down and get some pictures because you're the only one we can trust. The Mitchell brothers made porn history in 1970 with their film Behind the Green Door. It caught the attention of police along with its star, Marilyn Chambers. She was later arrested during live performances. I mean, I've never been arrested in my life for anything, ever. Uh, so this was kind of a big shock to me. But whatever the Mitchells paid their attorneys, they made back many times over during the next 20 years, earning the title Porn Kings. Most recently, the Mitchells had fought an ongoing battle with the city of San Francisco over a red light abatement law. The Mitchells claiming the law was an attempt to regulate their industry and their freedom of expression. One other story about a celebrity murder tonight, this one in Hollywood. Christian Brando will do 10 years in prison. Late today, he listened as a judge handed down that sentence in a courtroom in Santa Monica. Christian is Marlon Brando's son, convicted of killing his half-sister's boyfriend. Christian Brando had pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter and could have been sentenced to 16 years. But a probation officer recommended the minimum sentence. He says Christian Brando had brain damage from drug and alcohol abuse. Coming up next, we're getting the rain, but is it going to...